Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Very good morning and salam Adil Fitri. Welcome to our session of webinar section of industry brought to you by Faculty of Engineering. We are initiating in industry collaboration during MCO to have a platform with our captain of industry to share their thoughts, way forward and challenges during post-COVID-19. Today, we are streaming live from Facebook Faculty of Engineering. Today, we would like to welcome yang berbahagia Mr. Nakib bin Muhammad Nur, CEO of Tyrus, which is just in break and final, COVID-19 Accelerating Industry 4.0 Disruption. Without further ado, I would like to invite yang berusaha Professor Dato' Dr. Dr. Engineer Dr. Muhammad Rafiq, Dr. Abdul Qadir, the Faculty of Engineering to introduce our session today. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Murni. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to our speaker, Mr. Nakib. And also a very good morning to all of you watching this Captain of Industry webinar live through our Faculty of Engineering Facebook. First of all, I would like to say thank you so much to our presenter today. Despite his busy schedule, can still slot an hour with us to share his experience leading an aerospace industry. Let me brief all of you a short biography of our speaker. Mr. Nakib is CEO of Strand Aerospace Malaysia and President of Malaysia Aerospace Industry Association, MAIA. He began his career growing an, a UK aerospace startup and then returned to Malaysia to build Strand Aerospace Malaysia into an organization leading the design and analysis engineering services industry in Malaysia. Mr. Nakib has been active as an engineer, technologist, and business developer in the global aerospace supply chain since the year 2000. He speaks frequently on aerospace and other technology subjects at global events. His deep understanding of technology comes through his 18 years of experience as an aerospace engineer supporting the design and development of commercial aircraft and aerospace companies. Without further ado, I call upon Mr. Nakib. Over to you, Mr. Nakib. Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera semua. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Atuk, for that uh, very uh, kind uh, introduction. So it does cover quite a lot of uh, my background. Um, so it sounds like I should be older than I am, but uh, I'm today 44, 44 years old. Um, and I have been doing all those things uh, that you, you briefed uh, since I began my career uh, in the aerospace industry back in uh, the year 1999. So um, I've got some uh, slides uh, that uh, I would like to sort of share and talk through. Uh, okay, so uh, I think so everybody, can, everybody can see that. I hope the internet connection remains uh, re relatively stable so that we can uh, uh, you can get a clear uh, sound yeah, from, uh, from my home office here. Um, what I wanted to do today, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of aerospace engineers on the uh, live feed now, and uh, I understand there will be a question and answer uh, session uh, after this, right? Uh, having said that, uh, I, I invite any questions um, as we go along, um, and I'm happy to answer them. But what I wanted to do here is really um, talk about uh, some of the work that I have done um, in Strand uh, to do with uh, the fourth industrial revolution um, and uh, what my opinions are on how COVID-19 uh, affects um, what is happening to uh, the industrial landscape uh, of Malaysia today. So I think apart from the work uh, that uh, was uh, briefed by uh, Prof. Datos, now uh, I'm also today, Strand, Strand has got a few uh, verticals, right? So when I started the company, we were only doing uh, the design of aircraft. So I say only doing, obviously it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, and we're working on what you call primary uh, structures. So we were working on the wings, uh, the fuselage, the, uh, the um, landing gear. So these kind of uh, designs, and we were doing a lot of detail uh, design and analysis uh, work, right? Uh, so today we continue to do that as part of the company, um, but we also uh, have um, a consulting arm which um, I founded uh, probably about five to six years uh, ago now, 
which sprung out of our data analytics capability. So the data analytics capability we had is a natural capability that we have because we um, we design aircraft using a lot of data, right? So as part of the process of designing uh, aircraft, what you have to do is you have to look at a lot of loads data, a lot of structural data, a lot of um, uh, um, load case assessments, um, uh, and then uh, structural configurations uh, as well, um, which are obviously based on, on, on the raw data that, uh, that I described. Um, and then you have to funnel them into um, a prioritized uh, uh, collection of information, which then will design the aircraft ready for uh, operations, right, in the real world. So uh, that whole exercise is actually a data uh, prioritization, clean up, analytics um, process, right? So from there, uh, Strand had a natural capability to manage a lot of complex data, which are coming from different angles, right? Um, and then to synthesize um, outcomes and um, also then uh, ways forward or advisory. So from there, um, we began to do uh, anal uh, a data-based um, advisory um, for companies uh, looking at developing things like uh, industrial parks um, uh, and uh, also um, uh, state and federal government projects looking at uh, industrial roadmaps for the country. Um, we also supported um, companies to transform from non-aerospace sectors uh, into aerospace. So, for example, uh, UMW. Um, I think uh, at that point, just to mention yesterday, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, the CEO, president of UMW Group, unfortunately passed away. Um, Allah Yarham uh, Badro Faisal. He was a visionary CEO of UMW that got into aerospace. Um, and um, through his leadership and uh, the support of Strand, um, we got uh, UMW to become a tier one supplier to Rolls Royce. All right, so they went from uh, no experience in aerospace to becoming a supplier to Rolls Royce at a tier one level. That means they, they did directly with Rolls Royce without any second or third uh, tiers. Um, uh, oh, sorry, without any first tiers between them and the, uh, the final OEM. All right, so that was quite an achievement. And since then, we've advised many other companies from SMEs to large companies to do this transformation, right? Um, so why I wanted to give you that background is because um, as we were doing this, uh, we also work with the federal and state governments on industrial roadmaps. So um, I'm at the moment, um, uh, I, I've completed uh, first two phases of the Slango state government's uh, industry 4.0 roadmap. So I will share some insights uh, here from that work. Uh, but in there, what we were tasked to do was to look at the Slango industrial ecosystem um, and look at the different verticals, right? Uh, and then look at priority areas that the state can focus on and strategies that the state can adopt uh, in order to be successful in the fourth industrial revolution, right? Um, so uh, without further ado, then let me, let me go through some of these slides. Um, so uh, one of the things that I would like to um, emphasize here, right, um, is that uh, COVID-19 has actually uh, accelerated the fourth industrial uh, revolution, okay? So, so a lot of people ask me what, what I mean by that, right? Uh, but what, what that means is that um, a lot of the disruptions that we had anticipated for uh, Industry 4.0, right? So on the left of my slide here, you see data-driven manufacture, remote virtual workforce, online retail and delivery. These are all... Um, uh, activities um, enabled by technologies um, that were anticipated as being um, prevalent during the uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, prior to COVID-19, most of this uh, was anticipated to be sort of a five-year to ten-year sort of horizon, yeah, in terms of these things happening. Uh, if you look at the disruption that these um, these examples uh, uh, create. In, in the in the industry and marketplace, right? So we talk about data-driven manufacturing, for example, where 3D printing is uh, the the, the go-to technology most people would refer to, okay? Um, what it does is that it reduces uh, the need for logistics. It simplifies the supply chain because you're printing now, so you don't have to create 
uh, first a block of metal, so you don't have a material supplier creating uh, first digging up metal from the ground, and then a mill creating from that raw uh, ore into blocks of refined metal for different industries, and then supplying that to machining and assembly companies to produce um, components and assemblies, right? Instead, what you have now is somebody creating powder from raw material, from raw stuff that you, you dig from the ground, for example, and then um, that goes into a 3D printing machine, which then prints out what it is that you want to create, right? So that's a simplification of the supply chain. And then um, you, you find that with this kind of uh, technologies, Industry 4.0 is also about customization, right? Uh, so in the customization, it is about making products suit to uh, suit to use, right? So it's not um, a mass-produced product that everyone then buys one type of product. It is based on what is the need of the consumer. So in COVID-19, um, you find that the the the, sh the sheer disruption in the logistics chains um, has resulted in the need for something like data-driven manufacture by 3D printing. Okay, so let me explain that a little bit. What that means is that um, if now, for example, you see the headline on the news, news item there, uh, Malaysia seeks to clear congested ports to remove essential essentials amid curbs, right? So what happened there was that due to ships not being able to come in because of COVID-19, the supply chains uh, that these ships are enabling, which is the materials and so on and so forth, were blocked off, right? And going forward, um, you know, with COVID-19, this is going to be with us for quite a while. These um, lines of logistics are naturally going to be constantly uh, disrupted, right? By for one one reason or another, right? So for that, then with that, then um, it bears to reason that the new industrial landscape would be more internalized to the market, right? So you don't want to have to rely on. Uh, billets of material coming from the United States just so you can manufacture something of a product in Malaysia that you might want to use for the local or the regional market, right? So therefore, it pushes you towards adopting the technologies uh, on the left, which is towards 3D printing, right? So there's a localization of supply chain brought upon by a physical disruption of the transportation um, uh, lines of the supply chain, okay? So if I go down, then I think the second one, everybody, including as I suppose to the universities now, this is this is a, a given, right? Remote virtual workforce. We are giving the I'm giving this speech today here um, like this uh, on uh, prior prior to COVID nineteen. I would have probably been flown out to uh, to see you in UTM and provide this uh, this talk, right? But this remote virtual workforce now has become the norm. So Strand, for example, we work today. We are, uh, we are trialing two days a week, Monday and Wednesday, that we are in the office. Uh, so that's solely for brainstorming, physical brainstorming, when we need to do it. Um, and then on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we focus on product delivery, which we can do from home, right? So this change then, you see, um, I think uh, a few, maybe two weeks ago, there was an assessment. I think Zoom today is worth more than all seven of the world's largest airlines put together. Right, uh, Zoom, a complete startup, is now worth you know sep all seven airlines, top airlines put together. It's worth more than that. So what does that mean? That means that this um, this virtual reality of working, of collaborating, is now going to be a new norm. Um, having said that, for the aerospace industry, there is always a silver lining because actually the aerospace industry, there is only one way to physically still transport you at the speed that you need to, i.e. to go from here to the UK, for example, within a day, um, which is via an aircraft. Uh, and the other thing is that the, the, um, the, in the, the market uh, today, based on the backlog prior to COVID-19, uh, which is a backlog of 40,000 aircraft that are on order but have not yet been produced, um, was still um, looking at um, a population of about 20% of the world only having flown. That means only 20% of the world's population has ever taken a flight. The 80% of the developing world which has yet to take a flight. So uh, with that, there was still a backlog order of about 40,000 aircraft, right? So this will constant, constantly be a requirement for aircraft, but there may be evolutions. And the last um, uh, line on this uh, deck here, you see online retail and delivery, you see a drone transportation, right? So um, that kind of delivery system now, which is an aerospace 
um, uh, solution, right? Um, I know it's a toy right now for most people, uh, but in fact, uh, to fly uh, delivery services across the country will require the same level of air traffic control, in fact, more complex level of air traffic control as you do today with your commercial airlines, right? So um, in here are evolutions for the aerospace industry, but also now a major disruption for what will happen to retail real estate, right? So, um, and here's a, here's a very important point um, that with uh, retail real estate, um, which is your shopping malls, uh, so on and so forth, a lot of the developments uh, in the country are based on mixed development business models. So what you have in the middle of the uh, development is a um, retail um, and a uh, commercial space um, where it attracts a certain kind of business and a certain kind of population. And then um, outside of that, then you have housing and so on and so forth. So the valuation of the houses and all the properties around there base themselves on an overall business model of a mixed development, right? So if retail, for example, goes completely online, which if you go to a mall today, you will see this is a pretty uh, stark, right? There are very few people in the malls today. Um, then what happens to all this real estate, right? So there's a massive disruption in terms of the brick and mortar industry, which is a construction industry, okay? So, um, okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna keep talking here. I know there's a lot of information, but I suppose uh, there will be a Q and A as we go along. Um, so the impact of the national economy is quite devastating. Uh, I think this is particularly pertinent information to be sharing with graduates uh, because it's not going to be an easy next two years for graduating people. Um, we're anticipating, and this is some of the work that I did with um, the economic planning unit as well. Uh, these numbers are, are now commonplace within the government circles. Uh, we're looking at you know, upwards of 2.4 million unemployment, um, probably in the next three to six months, my guess is, right? I think by next, this week, next week, a lot of retrenchments will begin to happen uh, already, right? And it's a massive loss in household income. So this uh, COVID disruption, as far as the economic disruption is quite, um, it's quite dramatic, okay? So if you look historically at um, what's happened uh, in Malaysia, uh, you see A, B, C here are uh, previous economic crisis that we've had. Um, and uh, what's interesting here is that uh, if you look at uh, the crisis in the 1985 to 1995 uh, sort of uh, period, right? Um, how did we deal with that? Um, that first crisis was dealt with by, um, how shall I say, vitalizing the electronics industry. Right. Prior to that, we were a commodity-based economy, uh, you, uh, rubber, um, oil palm, um, tin, right? uh, those kind of commodities. Uh, and then in 1985, uh, when there was a commodity um, crash, um, the government um, pushed heavily into the ENE sector. And now we find that the ENE sector is a large part of our manufacturing economy. Right? Uh, then you have the, uh, the, the following crisis uh, shown in B, um, where there was a, more of a money crisis because it was more of a ringgit valuation issue. And you see a lot of corporate reforms uh, moving into C, where we had economic transformation. Um, there we had, um, uh, again, a, a money type crisis um, where the valuation of the ringgit again was, was affected. And uh, during, um, this is the Najib Raza years, um, he launched the economic transformation, which looked at uh, new sectors, sectoral growth. Um, having said that, it had some level of success, uh, not a full level of success because a lot of it was still um, um, at the at the very high level of project management rather than at the industrial development level that you see in A. In A, what happened was we attracted a lot of FDI that set up into the country and um, these guys then um, founded the uh, new manufacturing base, right? Whereas in C, we were we were trying to create new industries, but uh, we had uh, mixed uh, success with that. Having said that, uh, because it was financial, it was a lot a, a fiscal financial crisis. Um, it was um, addressed to some degree by the uh, economic transformation program. So now we have COVID nineteen, right? Um, and as you know, the uh, effect of COVID nineteen has been likened to um, sort of uh, the, what happened after the Second World War, right? Which is one of the greatest depressions. Uh, that the world has ever seen. Uh, this is the situation we are in now. And uh, so Malaysia now has to diversify its economic base and fundamentals. 
right? So almost revisiting A, which means we have to look back at our manufacturing sector. Uh, we have to look back at our services sector and we have to try and understand what would be the new uh, drivers of the economy um, post-COVID, right? So that, that's a big one. Um, I'm not sure if uh, there are questions <laughs> that I should take at this point. Uh, I suppose, yeah, I just suppose I, I just keep talking, right? <laughs> okay, so um, this is a, uh, uh, a breakdown of the GDP of our country. Okay, so if you look at it, 55.3% um, of our economy is based on services and 23.6% of manufacturing. Okay, so that's the, 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 the big chunk of our economy. So if you look at Industry 4.0, this is the two that get affected the most, right? So you come back to this, the slides that I showed before, right? A lot of this disruption is disrupting the blue and the um, red uh, sections of this pine chart, okay? So you can see our, our GDP and our economic basis is at, at severe risk, right? And because uh, industry 4.0 now is happening at a much faster pace, you know, as opposed to five to 10 year horizon, um, what you will see over the next few months is um, a degradation in this, what, 80% uh, roughly of the national economy and the basis for the ringgit, right? So here is where um, I think uh, at the university uh, level, um, this is not just a, a problem that, um, that uh, economists should be dealing with. To be honest, I don't think, to be honest, uh, most economists would be prepared for what this is, right? Because economists do not, um, do not build industry, right? Um, and they, they they develop theories of how economies should be run, uh, but they're not industrial developers per se, right? And if you look back at what this was, um, this is a fundamental shift in the economic basis um, of the, in the, of the uh, manufacturing and the services industry, okay? So uh, I think you should stare at this diagram for a little while because you need to absorb the impact that uh, COVID-19 and the bringing forth of Industry 4.0 will have on you personally, right? So where, where is the economy going? Um, I think you see a lot in the world now, they talk about um, a more balanced economy. Uh, and I think all universities have already been looking at this, you know, ecological considerations. Um, I think uh, Professor Zaini Ujang uh, speaks a lot about um, sustainability, environmental concerns and, and such like. Um, and this is something where um, the balance between the public sector, private sector and the social sector creating what in the World Economic Forum they call the fourth sector, right, um, is edging towards where world economies are going towards. Uh, you, so you find that uh, a lot of the economies which are successful in managing uh, COVID-19 um, have been economies uh, led by uh, female leaders, right? Um, and I personally believe it's because uh, there's a better balance of these three things as a natural instinct for, for, for women, right? Um, so how do you balance the public sector, the social sector and the private sector? If you look across the world today, there's a lot of talks about universal basic income, yeah, so universal basic income doesn't mean necessarily always mean just money in your pocket from the government. Uh, I know the stimulus packages that we've had uh, recently that the government have announced um, have uh, talked about uh, providing um, income to the people who companies are not able to provide income under the uh, conditions of the crisis, but that's not what UBI is. UBI is a perpetual system of providing um, either physical income, i.e. money, or means of sustaining somebody's uh, uh, housing, um, uh, food, yeah, uh, education, healthcare, uh, and transportation, right? And um, these five sectors um, will gravitate towards these business models, which is what they call the fourth sector. So if I take pr transportation as an example, uh, where aerospace again uh, plays a major role, 
if you look at the business model of the automotive industry versus the business model of the aerospace industry, the aircraft is utilized at a very high rate, right? So more than 80% utilization. You take your Air Asia flight, yeah? uh, it lands in uh, the airport. It's turned around within 45 minutes of you leaving the aircraft after you depart the aircraft and it takes off again and it continues to do this. So as an aerospace engineer, the, uh, the job of the structural engineer is to design the structure to continuously do something like that for 20, 25 years, right? So if you think about your car, um, your car's utilization is only maybe 15%, right? So 85% of the day, probably more today uh, under, under the CMCO uh, is parked or it's not doing very much at all. But you pay 100% of the value of that car, right? So um, for that then, the 100% value of that vehicle, 85% uh, is being wasted, okay? 85% is being wasted. In the aerospace uh, industry for, uh, for uh, commercial aviation, that would be intolerable. There was no way you can pay back the cost of the aircraft if your business model was to only use the aircraft for 15% of its life, all right? So the aircraft is actually used like a service tool, a tool to provide a service of transportation. Whereas the automotive industry today is about sale of asset, which is a car that you buy. Hence, you have so many different types of cars for you to buy, right? Because it appeals to a consumer sentiment. But if you talk to someone like Elon Musk, right? Uh, although today he's making what looks like very fancy cars, the end goal is not about making cars. The end goal is to provide a transportation service that would be utilizing assets at a much higher level, but probably via some sort of app, right? Where you call the car, it comes, you get in, it takes you where you need to go, you get off, it goes and picks up someone else, right? And if that were the case, and today your cars are only used 15% of the time, the rest of the 85% now, for a mobility vehicle, which is what the, this, this is called, a mobility industry, it is close to 80 plus percent utilization, which means instead of one person, one car, five to six people are effectively sharing one car. So what does that mean in as far as the production of motor vehicles in the world? I think in, in the US it's today 480 million cars or something like that um, that's required for, uh, for the US uh, market. Um, and uh, the studies uh, was, was done by, uh, I can't remember the uh, consulting company that uh, we've referred to, but it's a global study. Um, that would reduce to something like 40 to 50 million car, uh, mobility vehicles because of this one to five, one to six ratio of utilization. So if you knock down Toyota or Nissan sales by even 10% globally, these companies which are based on large volumes of production and consumer consumption would not be able to sustain, right? Because they are also very heavily geared, right? They're based on a lot of loans and a lot of uh, financial structures that keep them up where they are, but, but expanding. So they're always talking about expansion, expansion, right? They're trying to grow and sell more and more cars. So the 4.0 business model would be the opposite of that. It'll be about having fewer cars doing more work. So higher utilization, and hence that is a more sustainable industry, right? So instead of a car factory making cars for sale, you will have a more modular factory maybe that today will produce the cars for the mobility service. Tomorrow will be um, repairing cars for the mobility service. And then the next day would be upgrading cars for an upgraded service, right? And all of that, based on platforms which are part of a circular economy, right? So uh, parts get, get recycled, uh, metal gets reused, um, electronic components get upgraded, but always reused. So this is where the fourth sector in transportation will head towards. What does that mean is that there will not be car companies, there will be mobility companies, right? So uh, I don't think this is a very difficult thing to perceive. If you consider, uh, I think a lot of you may use um, services like Spotify. Um, and for Spotify, then um, what you find is that uh, um, what used to be when I was young anyway, um, a, a, a 
a preoccupation of most young boys and girls, which is collecting compact discs, right? So we go and we buy 44 ringgit, 45 ringgit per compact disc, you know, of the favorite artists that we want to listen to. Um, and uh, we will compile this and put it on our shelves as a matter of pride. This is my CD compilation. Um, and uh, we will listen to these uh, CDs, right? As limited by the number that we have on our shelves and the pocket money we had in our pocket. But today, uh, if I use Spotify, um, 11, 14 ringgit a month, I get all the music of the world up to hi-fi quality, right? Um, and I am not limited with any physical space at all. So what does that mean is that now more people can enjoy more music. Um, and therefore, um, the CD as a physical asset now becomes redundant, right? In fact, it becomes defunct. So if you imagine the whole industry that's behind production of these plastic CDs is now gone, right? So the effect of 4.0 on the uh, business models of industries gone past is, is quite significant. And I think uh, at the university level, um, engineers need to understand this because the future of engineering is about enabling a sustainable world irrespective of which field of engineering, whether it be transportation or energy or uh, even construction, right? In construction engineering, so I mentioned that, uh, you know, brick and mortar is now going to be a difficult industry to, uh, to sustain. Um, what would be the future of um, housing and uh, commercial uh, real estate? I think a lot of that will be in repurposing. So if you look at um, this you see paris is opening the world's largest urban rooftop farm right uh, at the same time i think in paris also now they have converted um car parks into um into vertical farms or urban farms as well uh, so that's that's a very significant step forward because what it does is that it shortens the logistics chain between the food and the consumer right so if you look at this um if you look at this uh this trend then um this um, change in consumer behavior, change in how the um, world economies work, and uh, obviously then the change in the uh, uh, politics of the world, which you can see today, uh, will be very significant, right? And in fact, uh, COVID-19 has basically made this happen today, right? So what today you see on a weekly basis, on a weekly basis, change used to take years to happen now every week something is happening that will make this happen right so um it's not something which is for the near future it is now here and now right um and so uh uh it's my second last slide uh, i'm not sure how am i doing for time but um effectively now um what we have is a uh, disruption model, right, uh, that uh, I've uh, come up with, um, with my team, um, for me to explain what, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of work that needs to be done in order for us to be able to cope with such um, changes in the economy and the, and the global industrial landscape, right. So here I've got um, what is uh, I call the uh, disruption cycle. So you have business as usual, which is, you know, what you expect um, a business to do, like the car industry, for example, right? So they produce cars for sale, people buy cars, they keep them in their garages, they take them out, you know, 15% of the day, uh, and then they park them again, and then they spend a lot of money maintaining them. So their entire business um, cycle is a business as usual, right? Um, and, uh, and, and for those then, um, what you can do is you can track um, what is happening with this business as usual models, right? Because um, as uh, as technologies um, evolve um, and, um, and people find ways of making business more accessible. So I think that, again, if I take the aerospace industry as an example, uh, the, the, the theme of uh, Asia, everybody can fly. Now everybody can fly, right? So the whole idea was allowing everybody what was the privilege of a few many years ago, yeah? So as it becomes more ubiquitous, the technology enabling it, right, makes these business model achievable, right? So emergent technology, market evolutions, you see in the quantification space here, 
um, supply chain evolutions, these will begin to disrupt what was business as usual, right? And um, you, you need to look at um, identifying these risks, market trends, movements of goods and freight, right? input output tables, uh, economic tables of countries, right? Um, will show you uh, markers of things changing within the uh, business as usual business models, right? And then as these things change, effective, if eventually a disruption happens. So I've put in the trigger there, there will be a trigger point, right? So a tipping point of some sort. In this case, we see force majeure, which is COVID-19, creating this major disruption. What's more important to note is that the, the issue is that what happens after the trigger point, right? We are going towards a new equilibrium. So uh, our government talks about a new norm. In fact, it's a new equilibrium. This new equilibrium doesn't go the other way back again, right? It doesn't, it will not reverse itself. So once things change, they remain changed and policy changes, um, governments will launch pilot initiatives uh, like you saw just now in France, in Spain, uh, universal based income, uh, urban farming, all these pilot initiatives will then effect policy change and there'll be systemic disruption in the business models of business as usual. And then the new equilibrium will eventually become a business as usual, right? So in the outer circle here, performance tracking, identifying risks, trends and significant events, controls and measures, these are all the things that we need to be doing as a country at every level, not just the government, but I think uh, at institutions uh, like University Technology Malaysia, I would have thought these kind of things uh, become fundamental to future research um, of, your, uh, of your students, of your institution, right? Um, because it, um, it, uh, it allows for um, us to plan what is it that we're going to be doing next, right? And then plan our business models accordingly, right? Um, so, you know, I described this um, for the automotive industry just now, right? So that's what it could look like, you know? So you look at today on the, on the right here, you see cars being manufactured, then you have technologies then coming in, all these autonomous mobility vehicles, you know? Uh, if you go to the Detroit Motor Show, they're just showing you autonomous, um, sorry, they're talking about mobility, no more about cars. And then finally, some, something happens, a market disruptor comes in, right? So whether it's Tesla, um, today the second largest uh, capitalized uh, automotive company, which is actually a mobility company now taking lead, right? And then a new equilibrium of solutions and so on taking, taking, uh, taking shape. And then finally a new norm, which is um, the elimination of a consumer car market, right? So um, I'd like to leave it uh, there for the moment because um, I think I have talked for, yeah, nearly, <laughs> nearly 40, 40 minutes or so. Uh, is this a convenient point to ask for questions? Um, then we will proceed for um, the questions from our viewers. Was the audio okay just now? Pardon? Was the audio okay just now? My, yes, yes, sure, of course. My, I, can, I can hear your voice clear, loud and clear. Uh, Hold on, let me okay. check. All right, okay. Very long question from Hanafi Azmi. Salam Senajib and Mr. Hanafi Azmi from IIM. How do you foresee the potential growth in space exploration technology to launch a resource satellite high, high altitude balloon during post COVID globally or maybe specifically in our country? After the success of Falcon 9, this act, it looks like there are many major, major space enthusiasts but lack of platform to continue. And in that future support, please advise me. Okay. Also, thank you okay. for uh, Dr. Hanafi. Okay. Uh, so, first question here, right, is that uh, so the whole time I've been talking, you notice I speak about this. So, first thing I, I need to uh, emphasize that I have no business training. Okay. So, I am, I am 
an engineer through and through, right? I start, I did my degree in uh, aerospace engineering at the Manchester University. I did a master's in aircraft design at Cranfield University with quite a few of my colleagues, which are now uh, UTM uh, you know, heads of departments. Um, and um, I learned doing business uh, as an entrepreneur, right? So I set up my, my consultancy services for engineering and I built up an outsourcing function uh, where we took work us in the United Kingdom and we did the work in uh, right? So I had to then train my engineers because, you know, a university degree doesn't um, ready you to do work forever, right? You need to be trained still. So I had to then develop a training capability and then help my engineers do the work, right? So I had to build it up from there. and then after that, I realized, oh, you know, I need to make, I'm competing with a lot of uh, Indian companies um, like Tata Consulting Services, like uh, Tech Mahindra, and all these large companies. You know, Tech Mahindra and Tata, you know, 100,000 engineers are making maybe 10 to 12 billion US dollars a year in revenue. Okay? So I was competing against those guys. So I realized that then I helped companies in Malaysia to bring aerospace manufacturing to Malaysia. So I did a transformation service, right? Based on my aerospace knowledge and my entrepreneurial. I, Thing, then I learned everything else on YouTube and uh, the internet. Um, I developed a consulting capability that allowed billion dollar contracts to be realized in Malaysia. All right. So now I'm beginning to have workflow that's coming from a Malaysian um, uh, supply chain. Okay. So platform you ask about. So first you need to understand what is the business model of space. I think there's a lot of fascination that we have with the technology of space, but you need to understand that the business model of space is something else. Yeah, It's not about the enthusiasm of space. It is about how you're going to make something sustainable as a means of feeding people or providing a service, right? In order for that to then create a sustainable industry. Okay, so the lack of platform, I believe is because there's a lack of space industry maturity in the country. I think there's a lot of people with the knowledge of space technology, but the understanding of a space business model is yet to be seen, right? And uh, at the Aerospace Industry Association, we have a space division under that. And that's why I can say that because I've not seen it yet, right? Um, so space technology, Elon Musk has launched last week SpaceX, right? Fantastic, right? But the thing you have to understand about what Elon Musk has done is that he has just basically made commercial space industry now viable to some degree, not completely viable yet because it's not yet a sustainable model. He's still subsidizing that. Don't forget, eh? Elon Musk, apparently, eh, uh, this is what they say anyway. This is the reports, right? He All his money goes into all the business, right? So he lives on loans and, uh, and uh, financing from banks, you know, as his own consumption, right? So he doesn't, he doesn't have his own money per se, right? Like typical entrepreneur, right? So we dump all our cash into our business to see where it's going to go, right? But we put our money where our mouth is, right? That's, that's what we have to do. And you may fail doing that. And Elon Musk has failed doing that before, right? Does it stop him? No. Richard Branson has failed doing that before. Does it stop him? No. But there are a million and one other entrepreneurs which have failed and may not you may not know of, okay? So the space industry is very much one now, as Elon Musk has proven from last week, one driven by entrepreneurship. So forget about your government giving you a handout to create a space industry. That's not going to happen easily under these circumstances. It is about you creating your own industrial opportunity and then putting your money where your mouth is, right? So I think this is one very important point to put out to engineers because I think we get into this mindset of we have nothing to do with the business. We are just there to create the products, right? Because that's what we're good at. You know, none of the successful technology entrepreneurs today are like that, right? All of them understand what they have to do to make their, their products commercially viable and for their dreams to be realized. But for that, some of them are willing to sacrifice their own luxuries right? uh, to just see a dream happen, you know. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's been my experience with the space industry in Asia. Okay. Okay.
Right. From Mr. Panaparumo, what do you say there will be no reverse on a Russian without being really ready for it? And what's your view? Um, well, uh, I think this is major canon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I can understand the context of the question. Um, there will be no reverse in that there will be a new norm. Okay, so for the aerospace industry, uh, major, yes, there will be a new norm. Will they still be flying? I believe so. I believe so. Um, having said that, even prior to COVID-19, um, the, the, the environmental pressure on the aerospace industry was severe, right? I think uh, the, Euro, the Euro standards required by the year 2050 that the carbon footprint of the aerospace industry be, be uh, uh, zero rise back to the levels of 2015, right? So imagine, right, all the supposedly 40,000 new aircraft into the sky and your carbon footprint was supposed to be back at 2015 levels, right? So um, there was already a push towards changing the nature of the planes. Uh, some conversations I had with uh, sort of technologists in Airbus, you know, they talk about modular aircraft, aircraft that last, that don't go for 25 years anymore, but they get recycled after five or six years. Uh, and because they're more, uh, you know, carbon fiber and they've got more electric engines and so on and so forth, you know, they don't have to have the right reliability of long term 20 years uh, life cycle, but instead have a five year life cycle, uh, which means that they can be more efficient in that life cycle. So all of those things would affect the aerospace industry fundamentally, fundamentally. Right. So there will be no reverse from that. Will there still be an aerospace industry? I believe so. Yes. Um, I won't be rushing without being really ready for it. Malaysia is not ready for anything. I, I can safely say that right now, but we're not alone, right? So everybody is uh, struggling. Our biggest challenge in Malaysia is that as a collective, as a collective, our triple helix construct, which is the con collaboration between government, academia and industry, is nowhere near ready to tackle what is the market change that I have just shown, right? So my belief is that we will go into a deep recession, a depression, right? But through there, just like in the Second World War, remember the Second World War, after the Second World War, we were, we were peers with Korea, we were peers with Japan, we were peers with, uh, with uh, Taiwan, right? Were, those were our peers, but those countries had no natural resources. So after the Second World War, they built industry. So from a sewing machine shop became Honda, right? From whatever, you know, some small uh, startup became Hyundai, right? Uh, so these countries don't have, uh, don't have massive uh, MNCs that run the economy. All the MNCs are Korean, Japanese or Taiwanese. Unfortunately, in Malaysia, we have a lot of resources. So um, after the Second World War, First thing we did was get got the British to come back in, set up businesses, and we all went for jobs with them, right? So that's what happened. <laughs> so it was a second wave of colonization, and then after that, we had a third wave with the Japanese conglomerates and then the American conglomerates. And so much so, I'm, I'm sure, when you, came, you know, right? What's your the ambition of most of your students is to join a big multinational and get a business card that says, I am an engineer in Airbus, right? That's, that's the ambition. But going forward, these large corporations now are being shaken by what are startups, right? So what you have to understand now is that the market is what we are now going to lose if we are not ready. This Southeast Asian market, you think about Netflix today, right? What was RPM and Astro's revenue, which is Malaysian jobs and Malaysian revenue before, is no longer Malaysian jobs or revenue. All that money you're watching Netflix with is going straight across the internet to where is it Sweden? I think it is right for Netflix, right or Spotify, right? Yeah. So there is an entire service industry disrupted before your very eyes, right? yeah. and it happened without COVID nineteen, right? COVID nineteen is going yeah. to be a lot more than just that. So to answer Adeline. your question, no. yeah, 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 Adeline. and I think. We have to say that now. We have to say that. Unfortunately, I think the government took a while to say that because, you know, Malaysians don't like to hear bad news, right? But I think two, three weeks ago, uh, the Gozapul actually said we are going into a recession. He actually said it, right? And the Ministry of Finance knows this, you know, but they've known this for a while, to be honest. They've known this for a while, but they've been trying to figure out how to get around it. Yeah. But COVID-19 has kind of made this even more devastating. One thing good, I think, about Malaysia is in you see that we band together 
Um, so our togetherness is still strong, although there are still racial tensions now which are being heightened. Um, so these are unres irresponsible parties, but I think generally we are we are going to be sticking together, right? But how do we realize what is the future of our economy? Uh, that's something we have to think about now. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Najib. Okay, we go uh, for the next question from... Okay, Mr. Jaffer Rahman. Good morning, Mr. Najib. Would you elaborate more on the design in general of Donia's freestyle and previous aircraft? Such beautiful aircraft. Okay. <laughs> but I don't know. I have done nothing about that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, they're just talking about the aircraft that we're doing right now. So this is the strength's biggest project uh, at the moment because Airbus and Boeing have not done anything new uh, in terms of aircraft development for quite a while now. Uh, most of them are uh, sort of legacy work that they're doing. So we do do a bit of legacy work, but most of our aircraft uh, work now is for the Donier C staff. Um, <clears throat> it is an amphibious aircraft. Uh, what's interesting about this was that it is a German, uh, you know, the name Donier is a very old German aerospace name. Um, the, uh, the industry was built around Lake Victoria um, in um, in uh, Munich, right? Uh, it's a beautiful large lake um, and wide uh, seaplane, right? That's where they did all the for the aircraft. Um, and uh, the Donier family um, of, uh, you know, over time basically um, became less and less uh, rich, shall I say. And the Sea Star was one of the designs that they still had under the family, which was eventually bought by a Chinese conglomerate, uh, sorry, a Chinese government. Right? So, in fact, it was bought by the Wuxi government of China, which is a provincial government. And the Wuxi government has got a very big um, um, island and a bay. Right? So, they bought this aircraft company to, um, to have a plane that can take people from the bay to the island and back. So they ordered 350 aircraft from the company that they bought and they pumped about 300 million euros into that company, which was dying at the time. And uh, Alhamdulillah, Strand uh, was contracted to do predominantly most of the engineering behind the Sea Star. So it's an old design. It's from the 60s. We have modernized it now with uh, new materials. Uh, we've lightened it up quite a bit. Um, and uh, we've productionized it to today's standards and uh, it's now going through its recertification. Uh, it's a it's an inline uh, pro uh, propeller, two propeller uh, engine aircraft, uh, which is quite strange. Yeah, it's very very cool in that way. It's got two propellers on either end, um, and uh, it um, it is about a six to eight seat um, aircraft, which has got um, a lot of different uh, sort of ferry functions as well as uh, search and rescue and uh, and uh, military functions as well. So yeah, we're very proud of the the aircraft. But interestingly, uh, it was originally bought. Uh, the design was originally bought, uh, but not completed the buyout um, in the 80s by Tun Mahade. So the original tools for the Sea Star actually uh, were in Langkawi for a very long time. Uh, but uh, I think that's one of the deals that fell through. <laughs> and uh, the Chinese eventually bought it uh, in the 2000s. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess it might be the last question from our viewers. Let me check for you. Okay. All right. Okay. Then, okay. I think that's it for now. No more questions, Julia. Okay. Thank you for our viewers and for your questions. And also, thank you again for Mr. I will pass to Prof. Um, For the last, uh, last few words, because uh, he's the place of our Dr. Rafi, because he has something to do. In, uh, yeah. We have. Uh, today is very hectic and very hard schedule for everybody uh, in Faculty of Engineering. But always we have such honor to have you for today and despite of your busy schedule, you are actually put your precious time with us and we are very, uh, uh, you know, we are very uh, grateful for that. Oh, okay, you have another question from Asya Umara. What are the implications to investors? Okay. Ah. Okay, uh, so that's, that's in fact, I had some slides actually to do with investment, but I didn't get into them I just now because I wanted the questions. But okay, since you brought it up now, um, well, there's a lot of different types, right? You might be asking as, a, as an equity investor, or you might be asking as somebody that invests money in the stock market, right? Um, I think uh, stock market, I mean, you can see it yourself, right? It's completely disrupted now. 
Um, and if you look at uh, the, the Malaysian stock market underlying most of our stocks, uh, the GLCs and so on and so forth, right? If you look at the, the Bursa you know, con, uh, construct, uh, most of it actually underlying it is infrastructure uh, project, right? Or commodity-based um, revenues, which is oil and gas and, uh, and palm oil and stuff like that. Right? So how I just explained that, right? So a company um, that does construction, maybe like uh, Gamuda or someone like that, you know, they, they get government contracts, they're a big part of the uh, stock market. Uh, but the government invests in those infrastructure projects. They may be building highway or whatever it is using what is effectively commodity-based money, right? They, they base it on oil money. So the construct of our bursa is, uh, and then whatever else is in a consumer type of market, right? It's a consumer market, it's a local consumer market. So a company like UMW selling cars only sells Toyota cars to the Malaysian market, doesn't sell it outside of the Malaysian market, right? So it is a contained um, stock market, the bursa, which really needs uh, new, new, new assets into it, new companies, new startups. And I know Bursa has been looking for, Security Commission has been looking for new companies and new investments to spice up the market a little bit more, right? So fundamentally, the Malaysian market, uh, I've already put all my money out of it. So <laughs> that's, that's what I can tell you about that. I did that, I lost a lot of money on it. So um, it's something which I, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an active investor, I was a passive investor, so it didn't, didn't quite work out if you're trying to do a long term on that kind of market. Uh, the global market, extremely volatile as well. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, speaking to people who are investing their money, because actually today there's a lot of money, right? You want, to, you want a space industry, you want 10 billion US dollars. I got people who have 10 billion US dollars to invest, but will they invest in your space industry? That's a question mark, right? So unfortunately, a lot of the money is conservative in that it doesn't want to go to places where they cannot guarantee their 10, 15, 20% returns, right? And the, in, the global investment marketplace today is volatile. So I think it's much more about value investing rather than passive investing uh, going forward, right? And, um, and uh, you know, some commodities like gold, I believe, I personally, as a Muslim, believe that those are the, you know, if you're a passive investor, that's one of the places to stick your money because nobody knows what's going to happen to cash, right? And at least the Quran has guaranteed the goal. Until the... So I think uh, uh, investors, tough time if you are the traditional type investor, opportunity time if you are a value investor, but you have to be very understanding. Uh, look, look at a company called Up Invest. They're invested in Tesla. You uh, watch the YouTube videos, Ark Invest, um, and you see how uh, how they articulate investment strategies. And you'll find that it's, it's very different from most uh, investment strategies of traditional investment companies. Thank you. Inshallah, you may some you do more. All right. Okay. Without further ado, I will pass back to uh, Professor Shuhaini Mansour. Okay, and thank you again for Mr. Nakir. Inshallah, we'll meet again in the future. Maybe after COVID-19 is over, um, please welcome the Faculty of Engineering in the campus Johor Bahru. Inshallah, okay. All right, then um, we... Oh, I would like to invite Professor Shahani to be with us today. Where is he now? We are waiting for him. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much, Madam Murni. <laughs> Good, bro. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I yeah. hope oh, everything is fine. Selamat Hari Raya. Maaf Zahir Batin. Yeah. So, I have to stop uh, the dean because he has something urgent to do. So, uh, on behalf of we would like to thank you so much for spending your your time and sharing your valuable experience right your busy schedule like yeah, i know you had a meeting in the early morning so then uh, yesterday was a dry run for spending your valuable time so i hope we can continue working together and strengthen our collaborations uh especially on your what do you call it you're pursuing this ir 4.0 so we here as a team we would like to support you as uh, much as we can so thank you so much for sharing with us 
And to all the viewers, uh, thank, thank you so much again for watching uh, our webinar series. Uh, and don't forget to, to join our next webinar. Uh, I wish you selamat hari raya, maaf zahid batin. Don't forget to like our uh, FB Live. So uh, to the students, uh, I hope that uh, you can prepare yourself for the week ever advised by Mr. Najib. Uh, for that, uh, thank you much. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, join again in our series. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Haimi, and thank you for our viewers today, and thank you for your uh, support for our webinar series, Captain of Industry. It's always a pleasure for us having our large number of viewers for our webinar, Captain of Industry, today. This week to our upcoming webinar with our next section of industry in future. With this, we would like to wish uh, Selamat Hari Raya, Maaf Zahir and, Bat Maaf Zahir and Batin. And from uh, no one of us would imagine this unprecedented time. But however, uh, please enjoy our session, our webinar series in future. And please enjoy um, your Hari Raya, your balance of Hari Raya, or Puasa Enam, or whatsoever. Stay safe, stay healthy, keep your social distancing. Please don't forget to like, comment, and share our program. Have a good day and wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.